Welcome, everyone, and welcome to Dr. Dave Stukas, who we all know as At Allergy Kids Doc. Um, hi, Dr. Stukas. Good to see you. Nice to see you as well. I can't believe it's uh, time for back to school and we're doing this. Again. I know. This is great. Here, that's exactly what we're here for, is to talk about that ever hot topic of back to school with food allergies and asthma. And it is always challenging, but I think we're going to be here to talk through a few of the great things that, that people can do to keep school a, a, a wonderful experience for kids. Plus, I should mention that we're going to be talking a little bit about one of my favorite topics, and that's teenagers. And uh, there's new research out on um, teens and risk-taking behaviors around food allergies concerning, but there are, again, are some things to know about. First, I should mention, you are also here representing, do you want to say who you're representing? Yeah, it's a mouthful. Uh, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I have the privilege of serving as their social media medical editor. And uh, given that this is involving social media, uh, we're going to, I'm here to represent that organization and they'll be posting it on their website as well and talk about some of the great resources available for everybody who's watching. Absolutely. Good stuff. Well, why don't we ask you to start us off with a little bit about the basics, which, uh, you know, one of the really most basic tools that we have to have for kids is an emergency care plan. And yeah. do you want to talk about that in terms of food allergy and asthma? Absolutely. Um, when I help counsel families about sending their children to school, it, it's all age-based and it can be very daunting, especially for children with severe food allergies, severe asthma. I mean, these are common conditions that can really impact their health, not only in the school building, but also at home as well. And one of the things that I, I like to help them understand is communication is key. So verbal communication with the school, their teacher, their school nurse, school personnel prior to the start of the school year, and then the written communication, because it's a busy place, right? Every teacher, every school nurse, they're, they're in charge of dozens of students, and it's easy to forget and have things fall through the cracks. So one way to prevent that is to have a written action plan that very clearly states, this is my child, their name, often have a picture, this is their medical condition, and then basically th this is the treatment that they need based upon X, Y, and Z symptoms. Uh, and that should be on file every single school year or any time that your child's doctor changes their treatment plan, it's important to update the school in regards to what may be different. Absolutely. And uh, so you've got that emergency care plan. Uh, and then there's also, if we go farther along and talk about accommodations, there's that individualized health care plan. And some people go and also negotiate a federal 504 plan, which is about uh, protecting a person's rights if they have a medical condition to inclusion. I would mention that in terms of what the plans are, that Allergic Living, we actually have a, a very good resource, um, she says, in modest leasing, as I put it together, but I didn't author most of the pieces, so I can say that. Uh, but it's eight tools uh, for school with food allergies, and it can be Googled or whatever, but it's got a lot of these key plans and what to expect, and it even goes along and gets into things like issues um, to cover in your 504 plan meeting. It's even got advice from the uh, uh, always wise Gina Close, the uh, for, uh, food allergy advocate who uh, actually helped with the CDC voluntary guidelines. I believe she was the director of that. Uh, and, um, you know, that she gets into things like you know, how to go about going and having your school meeting. And if people are still not even up to speed with the school, one thing they need to know is you can't always check in with your school if you don't think you've done an adequate job of making sure everybody's prepared. So what do you want to say, uh, Dave, on some of these plans? No, absolutely. And there's you know, there's a variety of plans available. Uh, I don't I wouldn't say one is better than another. And they all have very key ingredients, uh, including child's name, exactly what they're allergic to or their asthma and the medications that they need. You can fill out and have the doctor sign and things like that. Um, I'll add another resource. And this is truly one of the, the best um, multiple stakeholder collaborations I've ever seen. And this is through the SAMPRO program, uh, School-Based Asthma, Allergy, Anaphylaxis Management Program. And this is through the, uh, through the Quad AI, as well as multiple advocacy organizations. And if you just search SAMPRO um, allergy, you'll find it. And there's a whole, uh, there's toolkits about, you know, education and how to communicate with schools. There's actually versions of written treatment plans for both asthma and anaphylaxis. 
And it's just a wealth of information, but that's just one of many sites that really have this. So, you know, I, I think, you know, m most pediatricians hopefully are, are well-versed. I know all allergists should be well-versed on how to fill out these plans. Uh, and it's been a busy time of year for me. I, I throw a, a mini hissy fit for our, our wonderful nurses every year, just because my hand cramps from signing all the forms. That many. Um, I, I yeah. do it in jest because it's, I love it. And I love being a resource for the families we work, we work with, but boy, August is always busy. <laughs> yeah. But we just to say something about these plans in terms of 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 content, even just on the basic emergency care plan, there is a lot to know for people to be to make sure that people are fully aware of uh, you know how to manage that child's condition because anaphylaxis, for instance, asthma as well, these are conditions that can come up very quickly and turn very serious quickly. So I just want to stress to people why they're so important to get. Uh, and, you know, then then the other plan that you may negotiate with the school, something like a 504, uh, would get a little further into some of the activities and things that you'll be doing uh, with the school that might or might not involve food. And there may be appropriate times to try to say, well, can we make this not a food driven activity? So and there are various ones. So um, uh, really important stuff. Um, what about, you know, one of the hot buttons that comes up um, is the, the the cafeteria and seating. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is uh, this narrative has changed quite a bit over the last decade or so. Um, and it's interesting. You, you mentioned the CDC voluntary guidelines. There are now updated school based food allergy guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics and other professional organizations. Uh, and now they specifically state that there's really no medical indication to have an allergen free school or classroom. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I realize people listening may think that's controversial, but in the fact of the matter is it doesn't actually work. So <laughs> the evidence shows if you have peanut free schools, it, it actually increases the risk of anaphylaxis. And the reasons why are probably because people let their guard down and they just assume that everything's going to be fine because they don't let peanut in, but it's unenforceable. Uh, there's no way you can check every food and every snack of every student, and every staff member every day that the school year is going on. And the other thing now is it's not just peanut allergy that we have to worry about. There are children with very severe milk allergies, egg allergies, and other food allergens. So it can be, um, you can exclude them. So if we say this is just a peanut free area, it it, is, it doesn't. It sends a, a bad message to those children, those students that have milk allergy or egg allergy. It's saying, "Oh, your allergen isn't as important when it very much is." So I would I agree to... and and not fully agree with you on this, Doctor Dave. Just because I think you're you're absolutely right on. You know that we've all seen the rise of the multiple food allergies, um, and certainly things like just saying a, a school is peanut free is no longer. The, the way people are going. Um, I think that uh, there are times when uh, parents are, you know, have some kids, you know, particularly our followers, we get a lot of the people who have the kids who are exquisitely allergic. And, you know, they, they, they do have a lot of uh, yeah, history with anaphylaxis, et cetera. So they may want to, you know, depending on what they negotiate with their school, they may want to do something, uh, you know, a little harder. One of the things that we're seeing come up, though, as an alternative to that, um, you, you know, um, thing of saying, well, something is, I don't think people even ever like to use the word ban, but in set, instead of saying uh, a food was not allowed, um, to have something like what they call the allergy table, which mm -hmm. would include a bunch of kids with different food allergens. So you might be sitting quite near somebody who's eating your allergen, but maybe it's a way for this, you know, it's, it's hard in those cafeterias when you've got all these kids, especially in the younger ages, they're all moving around. And it's a way that they can kind of keep a, a good close eye on kids and see what's going on. And I've heard of situations that I think are kind of clever where they thought, well, that child's allergic to milk and egg. So we're going to set him down at the end of the school table uh, and it'll be a little it'll be a little safer. So I think your point overall, though, is a really good one that things have changed on this and there's some uh, nuance and some, you know, opening for doing things, you know, different ways, depending on, on the child and the school. Oh yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up. So I was talking more just on if anybody's concerned that the entire building isn't allergen free. And I think, you yeah. know, most have moved away from that. 
Um, but you're right. So th this is where 504 plans come into play and the nuance, because there are some children that have a very different risk compared to others. So uh, for those children that do have exquisite sensitivity to casual exposures or small amounts, yeah, we need to have a new plan for them. And you're right. And, you know, having that allergen free table where they can sit together or knowing where they, that they're at the end of the table, uh, which is very different than some of the really sad stories I've heard over the years of my child was forced to sit by themselves. Yeah, on stage, I know. 100, you know, 100 feet that away. We don't, we don't want that. That's not necessary. No. And that, now you're into a different form of exclusion, right? Right. That, that's <laughs> bullying in and of itself, kids, right? Now yeah. you made them feel like the weirdo <laughs> over there. No, that's not good either. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, but I think these things have to be thought through. And if you go in there again, prepared when you go to talk to the school, you do some of your homework, maybe even take some information from even some of the things we're saying uh, and, uh, you know, as I say that, uh, the, the, the very good, uh, resource you mentioned and, and our eight tools, uh, for schools, which uh, kind of gets into, uh, links to a number of these things on negotiating and, and the plans and stuff. I, I think they, they can all be very helpful. Um, what about, you know, a big issue that comes up when we're looking at these plans too, though, is kids carrying their medications. Mm -hmm. Um, love to have your thoughts on, you know, self-caring versus what about when it's in the nurse's office? What do you, what do you say on that, Dr. Dave? Yeah, this goes back to, I, I think every family should start the conversation with whether it's the, the teacher or the, the nurse every school year. What is your experience or your school's experience with a child who has X, Y, and Z food allergies? Because uh, that's going to set the stage. They may say, we this is the first student we've ever had. Okay, oh boy, there's going to be a lot of education that's going to be necessary. They may say, oh, no, no, we've had multiple students with this, and these are the accommodations that we make, and you know, here's the school nurse's office. So you need to figure out what the plan is in place and what their experience is, and that will then kind of shift things. So this, is, this depends on a lot of different variables. One, uh, where is your child's classroom and cafeteria in relation to the school nurse's office? Two, is there a full-time school nurse? Because most buildings don't actually have a nurse there you know, um, every hour of the day. Uh, is it locked away? How long is it going to take to get access to it? There's variations of this where you can have self-carry where, um, and this is what I like to provide documentation mm -hmm. for, so-and-so is old enough to carry their own uh, inhaler and or epinephrine auto-injector, but then we have adult administration. So we'll say, let them keep it on their person, but then when it comes down to actually using it, we need to have an adult supervise and use it. And there's no magic age where it's like all of a sudden they're 10 or 11 uh, because cognitive development is highly variable. And one thing I like to assess for in the office is one, can they actually demonstrate when they know that their body is, is not feeling well and they need to use their medicine? Two, can they demonstrate to me that they can actually use that by using a training device in the office? If they can't demonstrate those two very basic things, then um, you know we shouldn't have confidence that they're going to be able to manage their own condition and administer their medicine. Um, but that doesn't always have to apply if we just have them carry it. They can still be responsible for that and then have somebody else administer it. So there's a lot of nuance here, but that kind of gives hopefully folks some ideas of uh, discussion points to have. What are your thoughts on that? Exactly. Well, just I think those are are great, and and uh, I I like the point that you. you you raise about self-caring, even if, you know, you're not quite there to uh, be able to uh, administer it yourself. And I think we have to remember too, that I'm an adult with uh, a risk of anaphylaxis and I can't guarantee that I can always uh, uh, administer it myself if I'm, you know, if, an, if a reaction were bad enough. So I think we always want to make sure there's enough people who can take care of it. I like to ask the questions also about the school nurse, like, if uh, she, he is not there, um, who else is trained? Who can, who can help in case that there's that emergency? Um, and I also like for people to think about things like after school. So, you know, it's the old, you're on the sports field and the school is locked up. Okay, uh, is child self-caring, I hope? <laughs> you know, yeah. Does the coach know how to use it? And sports is just one example, but I, I think we have to know that. And what about the school bus, Dave? Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully there's a, a no eating policy, but that's obviously going to be unenforceable. Um, and then it's it's important to ask about that. Uh, what are the policies? Um, you know, can my child self carry on the school bus? And then whether they have their own device on the school bus and one at school it's separately, there's a lot of, you know, this is so dependent upon a dozen variables here. Uh, is the school bus driver consistent? Are they educated on signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis? Can they administer the medication? 
Um, thankfully, in my experience, and I think you know the the evidence you know bears that the school bus related anaphylaxis is extremely rare. Um, and so you know, hopefully that provides some peace of mind. But you still have to plan for it, and you have to have that plan in place just in case. And I have to just mention this uh, wonderful uh, lady down in Florida who negotiated hard to get her son uh, onto the school bus. We did a, a a story about her a few years back. They got the school bus driver training, and it was just remarkable. It changed this little boy's life because now he could he could go on the bus with uh, with all his buddies. So you know, yeah. it, you can't forget that part in all this and that it's the safety, but the inclusion factors is, is, is so huge for kids. So, oh yeah. And to be honest with you in this year, in 2023, there are so many evidence-based vetted resources available. There's no excuse for schools and school and bus drivers not to be trained on this. Uh, there's excellent material online. There's advocacy groups. There's, you know, every state probably has their own groups. We have the national advocacy organizations that provide this. So it, it, there's no excuse not to have training. Um, I'm giving and- you a high five for that one. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there you go. Well, the, the missed high five, but anyway, yeah. Um, but uh, now what about, uh, that's, that's a, a wonderful point. And um, what about asthma triggers at school? I'm thinking you can get, you know, they, they've even done studies showing how much cat hair will even come into a school. And, you know, they tell us we're, you know, pollution's an issue. Uh, wildfire smoke these days is an issue. Uh, you name it. Uh, what do you what do you tell people about that? How long do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so probably it's, not it, long it, enough. But you're right. Being, yeah, it, it's yeah. it's important to know exactly what your child's triggers are because that's going to make a huge difference. So if we if we're dealing with environmental allergens, you're absolutely right. Even if there aren't pets in the classroom. Uh, people who own pets, whether it's cats and dogs, they bring their dander into the classroom and they can act, they can, you know, cause somebody who's sitting directly next to them or nearby to have asthma and allergy symptoms. So that can be a trigger inside the classroom setting. Uh, certainly if there are pets in the school, that can be a trigger. Uh, mice. So a lot of folks who live in urban environments are sensitized to mice and there are uh, frequently mouse infestations in our schools, uh, which is unfortunate. Cockroaches are a trigger for asthma for some. And this is why it's not, these aren't triggers for everybody, but it's important to know exactly what your child's trigger is. One thing I've seen a lot in recent years, a lot of teachers are using essential oil diffusers because they think that it calms their students down. Well, that can be a huge mm. irritant for anybody with sensitive noses or lungs. Uh, and I've had many, many um, patients that have been triggered because they've been exposed to essential oil diffusers. And that counts for any type of aerosol spray, including cleaning products. Uh, you can you can think you're doing a great job, you know, disinfecting, but those are can be triggers for people where those small particles can get inside their airways. There's pollution while they're waiting for the bus. There's pollution depending upon where the school is located, if it's near major highways. Extremes of weather and weather changes can be a big trigger uh, for those um, children with asthma where exercise is a trigger. Of course, we have to worry about recess and gym class. Um, and those are some of the main ones. And then, of course, we have to talk about the autumn asthma spike and the September oh, yes. asthma epidemic. The September spike. Yeah. So every year it's going, it's coming, it's coming three weeks after the start of the school year, we see a huge spike in asthma related emergency department visits and, and hospitalizations because there's this trifecta one, that's the perfect incubation time for all those respiratory viruses to spread among students. Once they go back to school Two, that's typically when we see some extremes of weather and weather changes, which, which can be a big trigger. And then three, that's typically the peak of ragweed season. So uh, for students who are allergic to ragweed, that can be a trigger for their asthma as well. Isn't uh, there so- a fourth one too? I think Ooh. there isn't oh, there. Mold. The, oh no, I was get well mold, but I was going to say, isn't it also coming after people have a tendency to slack off on their asthma meds in the summer? So That's, I mean, I was, it shouldn't, but uh, we see it. Uh, so. Yeah, I was just going to say, this is, I love, love to see all of my patients with asthma for follow-up visits, even if they're doing great in August, because that's our tune-up. How have you been doing? What medications are you taking? What medications should, should we be using heading into the autumn based upon your history and all that stuff? So this is a great time to touch base with your child's own doctor and or allergist and make sure they're on the right plan. Okay. Did we cover it all? Did I miss any? Wow. I don't know. You covered a lot. You even slipped in exercise induced. That's pretty good. Uh, and, and what do you do about that though? What, when we mention that, so if your child has, uh, I think they call it formally exercise induced bronchoconstriction, um, 
is this normally just going to be using your inhaler ahead of exercise or, or what is the, you know, or, or when do you even know that you need that? Oh, this is a whole other topic, but one, clarify the diagnosis. So there's a lot of children with asthma who may experience symptoms during exercise, but not always. And that can be due to weather changes. It can be due to the pollen season. If they're fighting a cold, uh, that can alter their level of inflammation. And, and that particular day may be a trigger for them, but they're otherwise fine. But there are others who truly, every time they try to perform aerobic activity, that triggers their bronchospasm. Uh, so for those, oftentimes we would recommend using their reliever like albuterol at least 15 minutes ahead of exercise. And we want to make sure that we emphasize proper technique by using a spacer device to make sure all the medicine gets deposited in the airways. And we want to give a good dose uh, to make sure that they receive that. And then that, you know, typically in, can help a lot of kids, you know, participate to their fullest. But if it's not, that's when you need to talk to your child's doctor, because there are many other ways that we can try to get their asthma under control and enable them to participate. I would strongly emphasize uh, to anybody out there that's been told that your child has asthma, therefore they should not exercise, find another doctor. That is not true. We want everybody with asthma to be able to exercise and participate fully. And if they're not able to, we need to know about it and we can find a way to make that happen. Excellent points. Um, so turning to my topic of fascination, uh, teenagers uh, in general, but, uh, um, and your kids are coming up on <laughs> Oh, I've got one. He's 13 and Do a you? half. Do you know? It's, okay. It's a series of grunts. Okay. That's how we yeah. communicate these days. Yeah. But um, so we just did a big article with Allergic Living. It was mostly my colleague, Caroline Moasesi, who uh, was the main author, who I might add is the uh, mom of uh, two uh, now young adults, but uh, were teenagers. And she just found this so eye opening as someone who's just been through, you know, her one daughter's still in college and her, her son has has completed college. But what the they're finding in the research is that they're I mean, we've seen this a little bit before. We certainly have always known it about teenagers. There's been all sorts of, uh, you know, studies about the teenage brain and how long it takes to develop, et cetera. And it's all fascinating. But this was in relation to this was specific research to food allergy and and looking at students who have always been, you know, very versed on uh, food allergy management, know about self-caring, uh, know not to take risks, know to ask questions. And suddenly we've got these stories of people doing things like going on a first date uh, uh, without your epinephrine and to uh, an Asian restaurant where, you know, your allergens are all over the kitchen. What it's, I don't even go into a restaurant like that because it's not fair to ask them to try to accommodate me. It's just their cuisine, you know? So like you have to be uh, sort of mindful of where you're going. That was one example. Another example was a guy in a workplace. It was actually somebody who'd been working for Dr. Rushi Gupta and didn't bother to tell her, here's this well-known food allergy research, didn't, didn't bother to tell her that he had food allergies and you know had a, had a big reaction, he only took an antihistamine, didn't tell anyone. So we see these situations arise and these aren't new, we're, we're hearing about them more. And then in, in this case, we turn to these researchers, Dr. Linda Herbert, uh, who you probably know from Children's National, and Dr. Rebecca Nibb, who's over at Ashton University in the UK. And, and they're both doing some really interesting research on this and the findings about just how the the we always knew there was peer pressure but these kids are that susceptible to peer pressure too even when they know better and it's the big thing that comes out repeatedly is that they that that urge to not feel different and i would just love to know cuz you're so good with your patients and everything what do you do in these contexts and how are you helping people yeah, I'm glad you brought this up. And, uh, you know, this is a topic near and dear to my heart as well. As you stated, we've sort of known this for a really long time. And there's two overarching themes. One, the adolescent brain from a cognitive development standpoint, there's two major issues here. One is they cannot appreciate long-term consequences. So what that means is uh, when they leave their epinephrine at home, 
um, you know, they, they uh, don't realize that, oh, if I'm out to eat and I have an anaphylactic reaction, what that's going to mean for them. So they're really unable to do that. And it's just part of the development that comes back again for most people <laughs> by the time they turn into an adult. Um, so that's the biggest one. And then the other one really is just their, their mind is um, it's, it's hard to like, remember to do things on a regular basis. So they need constant reminders. So we can use that to our advantage. So when it comes to this peer pressure and people knowingly eating their allergen, cause they don't want to stand out or leaving their epinephrine home. Cause they want to stand out. One thing I've done for years is I role play and it, it depends on the age. I particularly do this when, when they're heading off to um, like, you know, junior, senior year in high school or heading off to college when they're much more independent. And I walk them through different scenarios. One, when you're in a romantic relationship or you start to date somebody else, do you tell them that you have food allergies? And most of the time they say yes. And I say, do you, tell me how you say that. Or what do you, what do you say? Do you ever show them your epinephrine auto injector and teach them how to use it? Uh, so just make, just normalizing it. Um, and thankfully these days, most people know somebody who has a food allergy. Well, it's not, I'm not thankful for that, but thankfully most people are aware of it. Uh, and it's much easier to have these conversations. And so I really walk through that. And, uh, and whenever accidents do occur, I, I, we, it's a learning opportunity. Well, walk me through what happened. Oh, I was out with friends. I didn't have my epinephrine. Okay. What can we learn from this? Um, and they often will say, well, it's important for me to have it. And I take it to the next step. I agree with you, but it's really hard to remember to do that every single day, every time you leave the home. What steps are you actually going to take to be able to do that? And everybody's a little bit different. So that's just sort of a, a tip of the iceberg conversation, but you have to have those conversations. And this is something that parents can do with their children, hopefully in a non-confrontational way, uh, hopefully in a way that just kind of normalizes like, hey, it's really easy to forget these things. It's easy to let a guard down. I want you to do these things. I want you to have fun. What are some steps that we can help you take to make sure you stay safe when you do them. Uh, so yeah, just start with the conversation. You know, what I loved in this uh, article was uh, especially uh, Dr. Herbert talking about uh, how how we talk to teens. And it's, it's different because they're, you know, they are growing up and they want to be uh, treated like a, a grown up. So, you know, where you might have told them what to do when you're younger. This is what Caroline found so fascinating. And she says, ah, I think I'm talking at them too much, you know, mm -hmm. instead of asking those questions that pull things out, because, you know, the typical teenager, they got their phone in their hand, they're rushing out. If they're not doing their studies, they're rushing out to do some sports or music or whatever. And, you know, it's like mom and dad, bye-bye, you know, like don't have time. So trying to get from them what's going on and is it checking in with them and is everything okay at school it's not easy dr herbert talks about you know picking your moments and for when you're talking really being careful um i have a friend who's very good with teenagers she's big on the while you're in the car you know <laughs> captive audience so if you can keep them off the phone long enough but uh but you know some of those things like uh trying to, if somebody does start expressing concerns to you, don't just say, oh, well, nobody's going to care if you're eating different food. S say to them things like, um, well, I, I can hear you have some concerns about that. Uh, do you, can I help you with that? What, what can I do? And I think you're talking along the same way, wavelength when I'm hearing you speak, Dave, and that that's to try to get them to open up and and make it about them so that you can find out what's going on. You know, uh, just to tell you a, another example of, of one of the, uh, I think there were maybe two of the uh, examples we had in this article. These teens started deciding that maybe they were growing out of their allergies because they didn't remember their big anaphylactic reaction that's absolutely imprinted on mom and dad's brains, you know, but mm -hmm. they didn't remember it. So they start to not take it as seriously in those cases. Anyway, I, I, just to throw it back to you, anything more you want to say about this stuff? Because I find it just fascinating and, and challenging. I agree. And uh, it, unfortunately, it is, it's relatively under-recognized. Um, I, I think these conversations kind of, um, they they don't occur on a regular basis, both from parents and as well as from allergists. And I think that we need to make this a normal part of anticipatory guidance for this age group, because it's really important. I would also just, just encourage people just ask questions, like really basic questions, like, how does it make you feel when all of your friends are eating something you're not able to eat? Sit back and listen. Uh, you may get one word, you may get a paragraph, you may get a 15 minute conversation. You don't know where that's going to go until you ask. And I will, I will just echo what Caroline said, don't talk at them. 
uh, you know, communicating with adolescents is a whole other topic. And I am by no means an expert. Generally speaking. Yeah. Right. Right. And we were all there. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, adolescents, they, um, they, oh boy, they, they don't want to feel different. Um, and they also just want to live their lives, but we need to find a way to kind of make them recognize why it's important. The other thing too, I would, I would try to encourage people is among the 600 things that we want them to do, focus on the two key messages. Uh, cause that's all you're going to get regardless of your intent. Um, so what's that going to be? Have your epinephrine with you, communicate with food handlers. Those are two really good ones. Um, but whatever that is in your situation, a list of 15 is never going to fly. I think that's very true. Well, anyway, I hope that, uh, that people found that, uh, helpful and, um, I wish everyone a successful, uh, back to school and college time. I know we both do. And uh, again, you were representing. It's at quadea underscore org uh, on Instagram and Twitter, um, also on Facebook. And yeah, we'll we'll post this to that channel as well. And uh, like I said, there's great resources on on that website as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share these great thoughts with us. Uh, it's been terrific talking to you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, Gwen, and thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. Uh, one last point, if I may. I, I have learned enough along the way that I know this conversation can be very anxiety provoking for many people out there. So uh, what the most important thing is have that relationship with your personal doctor and allergist and your child's teacher in school. Uh, whatever works best for you is the right path. So uh, I'll just, I'll end with that. That's great. Thanks so much.